For this review series, I've watched a lot of movies. I've reviewed them and gave the box office histories for them. But I've never said if I recommended a movie or not. It kind of goes without saying which ones I like and which ones I don't. Well, that is going to change with this review. Here's a list of movies that I watched for this series that I would definitely recommend watching. Of course, I've watched some gray area movies and some utter trash movies as well. But that's my own opinion. But these are my absolute favorite out of the movies that I've seen so far. In no particular order. With that said, now it's time for the number four worst cartoon animated movies based off of an animated TV series. Teacher's Pet. Wow! Why hasn't anyone given Gary Baseman more cartoons to do? I mean, the art direction in Teacher's Pet is fantastic. And the story itself is good too. A little questionable at times, but still good. So why? Oh, yeah. Fourth worst. That might be it. Teacher's Pet is an odd choice to turn into a movie because I don't really remember the series making too many waves when it was on one Saturday morning. I think The Weekenders made more waves than this one did. Yet, here we are. The film was released almost a year and a half after the last new episode of the series aired on Toon Disney. Either it did really well while it was on the air, or the creators of the show convinced Disney to produce a movie to bookend the series. My guess is, it did really well because why would they give you a movie otherwise? Again, the art style, as odd as it is, works for this movie. There isn't too many characters introduced, which tends to be distracting in other movies. They made the main focus on Leonard and his dog Spot, who passes himself as the boy Scott. And while other characters from the series do show up, their screen time is just enough where they do not overstay their welcome. The story is Spot, played by Nathan Lane, has discovered that a scientist, played by Kelsey Grammer, has found a way to turn animals into humans. Spot volunteers for the experiment, and it works! Almost as he's turned into a man. Then it gets weird as Man Spot and Leonard's mom, played by That 70s Show's Deborah Jo Rupp, starts falling for Man Spot. I know I've asked this question before, but what is the opposite of a furry? When an animal starts having a crush on a person? Because that is what's happened with Spot. Well, I'm not 100% sure of that. It's kind of vague. It may just be unconditional love on Spot's part, as being the family pet. Anyway, that's as far as I'm going plot-wise, because this movie has got to be seen. The story, the animation, the songs, the performances, they are spot on. And it is a pity that it did as well as it did. What happened? Well, timing may have definitely been a factor. Like I said, it came out a year and a half after the series was cancelled. That is enough for kids to forget about it. But there is also the problem that there was also not enough time for them to get nostalgic about the series. It's a good way to end the series. I'm just not sure it was popular enough to justify a movie. Teacher's Pet the Movie came out on January 16th, 2004. With nothing, too. Nothing as in no competition. Although the following week did see the butterfly effect come out. And that is it. This movie deserves more love. I am definitely going to put it on my recommendation list. Mrs. Helperman, me dummy Floyd, take us, Scott, please. Well, of course I'll take him. I've been planning to take him all along. Saints preserve us. Say goodbye, Floyd. Top of the morning to you. Hey, I do the cliched Irish dialogue around here. Due to my rules, there are a number of movies that cannot be included on this list because they only made it into less than 900 theaters. However, there are three movies that didn't make the list because there is no record of how many theaters they were released in. Do you know which movies they were? Stay tuned to find out after this. This is it! After this experiment succeeds, the world will never again call me Waco! And that includes you, Mommy! Honorable mention! Doug's first movie. We transition from one movie based off of a Disney series to another movie based off of a TV series that started out as a Nicktoon. Doug. Okay, so what can be said about Doug? 
Doug is basically Bobby's world, where Bobby is in junior high or high school and puberty kicked in. It's one of the first Nicktoons, so the series got popular that way. One of the problems with the series I have is I'm not fully invested in the characters all that much. You have Doug, Skeeter, Roger, BB, and Patty Mayonnaise. The only character I can remember their last names of because Doug won't stop talking about her. It's like, Doug, we get it. You like her. We all know you like her. Every character knows you like her. Shut up! I've always found Doug to be quite dull, especially as a main character. But he was popular, so I guess I should not be surprised when Disney bought Jumbo Pictures that they decided to revitalize the series. Unfortunately, what happened was when Disney brought back Doug, this was the start of the whole Disney Goes to School series, as they started moving away from action adventure series. This is too bad because why can't we have both? I mean, every character in the Disney series started going to school at that time. Hercules started going to school. Cusco from Emperor's New Groove started going to school. Thank goodness for Kim Possible, who went to school and had action and adventures. Anyway, getting back to the movie. The movie itself is not that long. I don't think it's even an hour and 15 minutes, which is okay, because a slice of life 15 minute episode series does not translate all that well into a feature length film. God Guys, this movie was boring. I keep waiting for something to happen. But then you realize you're watching an hour and 15 minutes of Doug. It's boring because it drags on and on. It jumps into the plot without any real explanation. Something about looking for a lake monster for some reason. Was this even brought up in the show? Because Skeeter act like he's been looking for this thing for years. The comedy in this movie is for little little kids we have the ha-has and the ho-hos when the monster shows up at Skeeter's house. And they name the monster after the author of Moby Dick, Herman Melville. They have the monster dress up and pass itself off as a human because ha-ha-ha-ha. And we have Patty Mayonnaise thinking Doug has Google eyes for Herman Melville. And we have an evil corporation that wants to kill Herman Melville because he was created by the pollution that was being dumped into the lake where he lived from that company. You know... It's very hard to take any movie's anti-corporation message seriously when they are made by big corporations, especially Disney. We have a love triangle, whatever. You know, none of this matters because the movie failed to do one thing that is important for any movie, and that is, I was not entertained. I was bored out of my mind with this movie. Doug's first movie? This is pretty much Doug's only movie. I am not invested in these characters, but I'm not given any reason to be invested in these characters. I don't care about Doug's crush on Patty Mayonnaise in this movie. To tell you the truth, I don't care about his crush on her in the series. I am 10 times more invested on Helga's crush on Arnold and Hey Arnold than I ever was on Doug's crush on Patty Mayonnaise. Quite honestly, the only thing that I enjoy that I got a good laugh out of is Roger making these smart kids build a robot to catch the lake monster. The whole thing really has no reason for being in the movie outside of padding. Everything with Roger and the robot is the best part of this movie. As I said before, this movie is dull. The characters, with the exception of Roger, is dull. The love triangle with Patty Mayonnaise and I forget the guy's name. I believe his name is Guy. He's dull. My attention was averted so many times that I had to stop the movie more than once in order to get my focus back on it. That is how boring this movie is. However, it's not the worst performing. I think it's close to halfway on the performance list. I could be wrong. So why is it halfway? I can't really say. It came out on March 26th of 1999, three years after the show premiered on Saturday mornings on ABC. So maybe the popularity has died down by then because there is nothing of note that came out in theaters at this time. Unless you count Baby Geniuses two weeks before. Nope, no one is counting Baby Geniuses. Also, if this is a movie about Valentine's Day, then why is it coming out at the end of March? What came out during Valentine's weekend of 1999? Disney's My Favorite Martian? Really? Really? Was Disney so afraid of these movies competing against each other? I don't think the results would have changed even if they switched release dates. Just saying this was not a good winter and fall for Disney. <laughs> Do you 
you know which three animated TV series movies did not have a record of how many theaters they were released in? They are Heathcliff the movie, He-Man and She-Ra in The Secret of the Sword, and Pound Puppies, The Legend of Big Paw. By the way, the He-Man and Heathcliff movies were just episodes of the TV series merged together. The He-Man movie was actually the pilot for She-Ra. Pound Puppies had all new animation and original songs. It made less than $600,000 at the box office, adjust for 2017, and that's a little over a million dollars. That is worse than Gem and the Holograms. Pound Puppies would have been my number one worst performing movie if it wasn't for the fact that we do not have any record of how many theaters the movie was released in. Stop it, you big fish! I'm glad we're getting rid of you! You're nothing but bad news! You lost me, the only person I ever cared about, and now I wish... Look, man, I brought you The fourth best performing. Rugrats in Paris, or the continuing saga of parents that really should not have kids. Because holy crap, these are the least attentive parents in the world. Maybe Geppetto has them beat. Who sends a kid out on his own the day after he just comes to life? Fantastic movie. We go from a movie about a Disney show to a movie about a Disney show that used to be a Nicktoon, to a movie that is a Nicktoon. I would love to say I had that planned. I didn't. Rugrats in Paris feels like a big deal, and it's nice that it focuses on other characters besides Tommy. Now I can't say I can compare it to the first Rugrats movie since the last time I saw it was 18 years ago and I've only seen it once. I've slept since then. However, I love that the movie centers around Chucky finding his mom and thinking a princess would do. I like the villains Klaus and Claudia, Wait, wrong French duo villains. I mean Coco and Jean-Claude, as cliche as they are. I love the whole mixture of emotions when it comes to Chucky and his dad, Chaz. Because you do feel bad for them when it comes to their loneliness. It's a movie where everything is bigger. The thread is bigger. The adventure is bigger. And it's a whole lot of fun. I love how they went all out with the Reptar robot and how fun it was that a grown man was fighting a bunch of babies. It's a nice, goofy, lovable change after watching Rugrats go wild. Now there are a few complaints, and I do have a few of them. The first is the songs. Now thankfully we only get bits and pieces of the songs. Even when the Rugrats are singing the songs, they're not all that good. Well, I do like the Chucky e. Chan song, even though it's pretty much filler and I could have done without the Angelica parts. Then there's the song Bad Girls, which is sung by Angelica and a bunch of sumo wrestlers. That was uncomfortable to watch and ended mercilessly short. But a lot of the songs are kind of out of place and just there to be part of the Rugrats in Paris soundtrack. And then we have to talk about Kimmy. She was kind of shoehorned into the series with this movie. She feels like a throwaway character, especially if you didn't realize she was going to be a part of the show. Kimmy is easily the most forgettable character in the movie. Outside of showing the Rugrats around, she has no real personality. In the end, it is really nice that they wrapped it up with Chucky getting a new mommy. And the adventures of getting to that point is really nice. But can anyone capture Chaz Finster's heart just by reading an old children's poem? I mean, that is kind of shallow. So this is the fourth best performing movie. What was it up against? So on Friday, November 17th, 2000, it was up against and stood its ground. How the Grinch Stole Christmas. It didn't beat it out, but it's still impressive it did as well as it did. Later on, it was up against 102 Dalmatians, The Emperor's New Groove, and Dude, Where's My Car? So the movie did impressively well considering what it was up against. And I can definitely recommend Rugrats in Paris. <laughs> So that's our video. If you liked it, please hit the like and subscribe button. Also ring that bell for any future videos that I publish. You can find me on Facebook under Tunamp Arch and Entertainment. Find me on Twitter under Tunamp Reviews. Find me on Tumblr and DeviantArt under Tunamp. Or support me on Patreon under Tunamp. Ugh, eating this goo is making my tummy bubbly. I thought he could only do that in the bathtub.